Our next speaker is born and raised in Germany. Um, he lives and works as a PhD student in Canada as a member of a research group on extremist politics in democratic systems. And he'll give us an insight into the public discourse in Germany focused on the so-called Alternative für Deutschland. Please welcome Alexander Bayer. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, people, for uh, showing up uh, in the Saalborg. Thank you, the internet, for watching. Uh, a very big thank you for the organizers for giving me the opportunity to, uh, to give this little talk. Um, yeah, my name is Alexander Bayer. Uh, and everywhere I went this winter, I didn't have to wear a winter jacket because the temperatures were very mild. And I will tell you in a minute why that matters. Uh, as already said, I'm uh, a member of a research group uh, in Vancouver where we uh, look at uh, what happens, how, how, how extremist parties and politics fare in democratic systems. Uh, and we decided to focus uh, this research project on the fascinating, for researchers, fascinating case of Germany uh, and uh, asking the questions if we can point fingers And uh, is it a, 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 valuable, a valid judgment to say the media, the media is to blame for the rise of the AFD? Uh, for anyone who, who decided at the end of 2017 that they would spend most of 2016 in hibernation, which seemed like a pretty good idea at the time, uh, I will give a quick rundown what happened. So we had an election in September, uh, and uh, the, the domino piece that was Germany fell domino piece in a sense that uh, all around in Europe, far-right parties had uh, considerable success in the past, in the recent past, uh, and Germany was the sort of last stalwart in, in Central Europe where a far-right party did not get into government. This happened in September, uh, and it uh, did not only get into government, uh, into parliament, it also... Uh, the way that it looks like now, it might become the official leader of, of the opposition. So when these results came in, uh, pundits were really, really quick to call the shots. Uh, the, the, the dominating sentiment was that it was the media's fault. They uh, took the positions of the AFD and gave disproportionate amounts of coverage to this far-right extremist party. Uh, and this sentiment had a lot of truthiness to it. So it had a lot of, uh, yeah, sure, I, I can see why that, I, like, right? Everyone that opened his newspaper or opened a, a, a news website, uh, stories about the AFD seemed, or about, any, about something that's related to the AFD, seemed to dominate coverage. Uh, this went along with a little bit of, 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 a, of, a, of a felt truth, uh, um, a, a truth that was perceived by people about how uh, the campaigning season was a lot of season and not a lot of campaigning, despite Martin Schulz's best efforts. Uh, a whole lot of sunshine, but not a lot of conflict. And this was something that uh, then was perceived to be very, well, I don't want to say very skillfully, but somehow filled by the AFD uh, and, and the topics that, uh, that are con of concern to this party. So uh, what are we doing today here? Uh, first off, I'm a political scientist by trade, uh, and uh, political scientists uh, like theory. I know that this is a, uh, a, an event where uh, theory might not at the forefront of everyone's minds, but it is for me, because uh, talking and arguing to political scientists about theory is kind of like mud wrestling with a pig. Uh, you do that for two or three hours, and then you realize, oh, this pig actually, actually enjoys this. Uh, so. I'll be sort of, I have one slide on what we, what, what previous theories would suggest has, have happened and how it could have happened. Uh, then I'll show you what kind of data we have uh, collected to systematically answer this question and talk about public discourse in Germany. Uh, then to the, 
the meat and potatoes of the talk uh, about how the campaign unfolded in the media. And uh, I will uh, then, to end, I will show some more data that is a bit different uh, that paints a picture on uh, why this election was a special election and uh, why it was sort of a perfect storm of an election for a far-right party uh, and why this actually makes us claim that the media could be said to have behaved pretty reasonable as a little teaser. Okay, theory, one slide. Uh, two possible mechanisms of media effects. There's this normative, very endearing and, and, and wonderful idea that if you read something that someone carefully crafts and uh, he or she constructs uh, uh, an argument that is well-written, well-made, you read this, you take it in, you're persuaded by that regardless of, uh, of what this argument is. Uh, 60 years of media research suggests that this doesn't happen. Uh, Pre-existing opinions are extremely difficult to change in uh, each and every, every single one of us, even though we're likely to admit that, no, 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 sure, I, I'll, you know, I'm a rational thinker, I, uh, uh, I take standpoints if they're convincing to me, and I, uh, I internalize them, but it's not how it works. The second possible effect, and the one that will be of, uh, of concern to us today uh, at, at the core of the presentation is something that's called priming. So the media uh, can't tell people what to think, it can't persuade people independently of the previous opinions that people have, but it's really, really successful in telling people what to think about. Uh, it's super good, the media is super good, reading something is very effective in bringing something to the front of your mind. And here I, uh, uh, here I can tell you why I told you about my, uh, my choice of attire in winter. The uh, vast majority of you probably thought when I said this, oh, I didn't have to wear a winter jacket. Uh, wow, what's, what, what, who is this guy? Uh, but maybe a few of you thought, yeah, sure, it was pretty mild, that's climate change. Uh, so without naming the, the issue, I, uh, uh, there's a chance that I primed a few of you to consider climate change and pull that in your frontal lobe at the front of your mind. Um, and this is, this is important. This is a, a, the, the central thing that we have to consider if we ask uh, if the media wrote up a party like the AFD. Uh, also important to consider here is that uh, priming is easier or there's an indirect effect of priming as well, where a, a topic that is owned by a specific party, uh, that's the thing that then favors the party subsequently. So if the media writes a lot about refugees, a xenophobic far-right party that has this problem of refugees at the core of their agenda will reap in benefits in our minds in that uh, its agenda will, be, will, will fall on fertile ground. So far, the theory, that's all. Uh, so what do we do based on this theory? We, we collected data, uh, lots of data. We, have, uh, we understand this data to be, uh, we understand this text that we collected to be data, and we use natural language processing uh, to analyze it. Natural language processing basically means that uh, we're giving language to a computer that wasn't written specifically to be understood by a computer uh, and try to extract meaningful analysis based on what the computer is doing with this. So we used some, uh, um, some sifting methods to collect uh, about 8,500 articles from uh, four central German news websites, Focus, Bild, Welt and Spiegel, and we have that results in a unique data set that, to our knowledge, no one else uh, has. If so, please reach out to us. Uh, and this data set is so unique that it deserves at least six fire emojis. Um, it is also pretty exciting because that was pretty cheap. Uh, we were two people that were mainly concerned with, with uh, collecting this data, and I don't want to uh, calculate my hourly wage um, but 
uh, it was almost done with no financial expense. And this is cool because we're social scientists, we're, we're faced with this problem, with this very interesting case uh, of Germany um, sort of falling in line, very delayed with, with lots of other countries around it, around it in terms of um, the far right party uh, getting their scenes in parliament. And we can use methods that are available to us if we're sort of like sitting down and reading a stack overflow and teaching those methods to us to, um, to systematically try to answer this question. Let's dive right in. The share of party mentions in online news. So what we did for each day, uh, we calculated what the total number of mentioned political actors is. We did that based on word lists that we, uh, that we carefully crafted that included uh, candidates' names and party abbreviations and party names and things like Kanzlerin and Kanzlerkandidat for the uh, CDU, CSU and uh, the SPD, respectively. Uh, and we uh, let that thing rip through our little R script that we have. So the average of, of mentions of each party over the course of the campaign looks something like this. Uh, between July 1st and September 24th, that's the, uh, that's the time frame that we concentrated on, <coughs> we see a clear uh, uh, incumbency bonus, the Kanzler bonus, Kanzlerin bonus uh, for, for the CDU, CSU, Social Democrats, high 20s, and the AFD at 10.7%. Here we might say, at the smaller parties, uh, uh, a little note to the green and the, and the left. So with this dictionary method, it's kind of tricky because we can't say, oh yeah, uh, well, we're just going to count every occurrence, uh, occurrence of Grüne and Linke uh, for the green party and the left party because then we get stuff like the green banana and the left hand that is counted for them. Uh, so that's why here we're only using candidates' names. That's why they probably, uh, they sort of underperform. But for our purpose of talking about why the, if the AFD get, uh, got favored by the media, we're sort of letting that drop under the table. So the story here is, over the course of the campaign, 10.7% of mentions were, uh, uh, were happening uh, f that mentioned the AFD. Basically, case closed, right? AFD got 12.7% uh, in the election. That doesn't really sound like it's, uh, it was favored by the media. And a few of you might, um, uh, might know this, this analysis from uh, a blog post that me and Constanze Kurz wrote for Netzpolitik sort of like 45 seconds after the election when we worked on truncated data. Uh, and we also focused on print, uh, on, on print media. Uh, and this is sort of what this graph looked like that we based our, uh, our conclusion on. Ah, AFD didn't really get any disproportionate amount of coverage. It actually is in the, in the last week of the campaign, last weeks of the campaign, it actually is outperformed by the FDP. Uh, science is the, is the current state of airing, or the, uh, so uh, now that we have better data in terms of online news data, this whole story looks a bit different. If we uh, take the average over the whole course of the campaign and actually have it shown to us day by day. And this is one of what I want to focus on now. Uh, so just looking at the sort of tail end of this all the way to the right when we get close to the election date. The order of this is surprisingly close to the actual election results. The parties actually do get in in the order uh, that they came out of the election. But uh, we do see a little curve that gets closer to a curve that should be bigger. Uh, and this is where the, uh, where the well, I don't, don't want to say magic, but this is where the, the interesting stuff lies. So let's look at the curves one after the other. Uh, the, uh, the CDU, CSU, as you would expect, as the incumbent, anything that is remotely political in uh, domestic and international politics will score mentions for the chancellor and the CDU, CSU. That's why this curve is considerably higher than the others, but we do see a downward tendency the closer we get to the campaign when campaign coverage shifted from the incumbent to the competitors, especially the underdog competitors, uh, which is kind of, uh, that's a bad uh, transfer to the SPD now. Uh, but if we look at the curve of the, of the Social Democratic Party, there's a slight bump around August and Martin Schulz really tried to drive home this, um, this issue of, uh, of justice as the central campaign promise. 
Uh, and there's an, another little slight hump around September 1st, beginning of September, when the, uh, the televised debate happened. Uh, but the overall trend is pretty linear. Doesn't seem to be if we would just smooth this plot out to be a, st a straight line, it probably would be pretty much horizontal. Uh, not so for the AFD. So remember, over the course of the campaign, they got 10.7% uh, on average of mentions. And that's true. If we calculate an average of that, of course, uh, this looks like it scores uh, considerably lower than the two major parties. But something happens in late August, uh, and all of a sudden, this party gets actually close to, uh, to the Social Democrats. It, like, starting in late August, the tendency becomes one that is pretty considerably upwards. And if we take the average of only the two last weeks before the election, uh, we get to a number of 19.6 of all mentions uh, are, uh, uh, are talking about the AFD there. Uh, which is something, if we think about the mechanisms of priming, those are, those are short-term short effects. We're looking for things that happen over a short term or have, have an effect in a pretty short term. So this is something that is extremely, extremely important. Uh, at the beginning of this time frame, where the plot becomes some, something that has a trend that shows upwards, it's around like August 28th, where that first little, first little mountain, first little summit occurs, uh, two things happened. One, a refugee boat capsized in the Mediterranean, an event that we uh, sadly and have to see terrifyingly often, and 100 people died. Uh, and the second thing that happened was that Alexander Gauland, uh, in an interview, claimed that a German politician should be dumped in Anatolia. Uh, and it's interesting if you if you uh, if you talk about if you if you extract the topics that are covered in relation to the AFD before and after this moment, before this August 28th, it's a lot about uh, Alice Weidel writing emails where it turns out she's not the public persona that she claims sh she is, and it's a lot about internal rifts of this far-right party, the, uh, the internal tensions between the super far-right wing, wing and the far-right or right-wing wing. wing. Uh, and afterwards, uh, there's a surprising amount of, of citations of this, oh, we're gonna, we should dump uh, this person in, a, in another country. So that's something that indicates that this strategy of, uh, of sort of provoking a scandal uh, paid off. But let's, before we get into that, let's uh, look into the topics that were covered over the course of the campaign. We did the same thing, we developed topic dictionaries with, uh, with keywords for each category, and we let our script read through all the data and count occurrences. So, looking at this, we see a sort of uh, band there in the 10% range where it's all uh, a colorful rainbow, where the topics don't really, uh, don't really diverge from each other. Uh, except for uh, that topic of domestic security, which is there at the low end of, of the range. Uh, but we do have one topic that stands out quite considerably in the early months of the uh, Wahlkampf Sommer, which is uh, European Union, general European Union topic. Uh, this is because on July 1st, Helmut Kohl, the eternal chancellor, uh, got the first European act of state, and a lot of things were written about his legacy in terms of the European Union, and lots of people showed up from Strasbourg and Brussels and paid their respects. This is why this topic um, seems like, or this is why this topic comes in as strong as it does here. Another topic that has a sort of unusual uh, uh, curve here on our graph is the topic of the environment. Our dictionaries that we developed were topical, uh, and so what causes this steep, steep summit there in early August is uh, the diesel gipfel, there, uh, the diesel summit where uh, German car manufacturers try to uh, uh, sort of get out of the fact that they basically uh, uh, ripped off customers with selling cars that uh, emitted toxic amounts of, of uh, poisonous gas and dust. This is why this is extremely important in the, high f in the, in the low 40% range uh, in early August. But afterwards, the trend line points steeply down. A topic that was pretty consistent over the course of the campaign 
in, in its overall dynamic, or at the sort of, the, not the overall, overall dyma dynamic, but the role that it played is the topic of immigration. And immigration means migration and refugees in, in our case here. Uh, and now thinking about what that means in, in relation to our theory on priming, we would think that, sure, that's a topic that is owned by the AFD. It's, it's, like, it's super tightly connected to, to that party's rise. Uh, so this is something that does favor uh, a far-right party like those, those are, like it is. Uh, but we can do a sort of more systematic investigation into this. So this graph shows you uh, the polls. Each dot represents uh, 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 polling results for the AFD. Uh, and the line is the average out of those polls, again, over the course of the, of, of the time frame that we surveyed. Uh, pretty much constant until mid-August. And all of a sudden, we have increasing variance, and we have a tendency, a trend line that points upwards. And now, this is where the heart of the story lies. Is this, is this dependent on the mentions that the AFD got in the media? This is the orange line. Now we have a, a, sort of, we have a, different, uh, a different scale of our graph. That's why it looks way more nervous than in the bigger one that we had. Uh, hmm. Difficult to say. Uh, if you have data like this, time series data, you actually want to get rid of trends in terms of uh, what the analysis should be like. So one way to do this uh, in a graphic representation is um, by not showing the absolute values and how they develop, but only showing the change from day to day and plotting that. This is what this graph does. So here, uh, these two lines dance around the zero mark because, especially the blue one, uh, where it's the polling uh, results, there wasn't a lot of variation from day to day. It's in incremental steps that the curve points up and down. It gets a bit more, uh, a bit higher in variance around uh, the, 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 after the mid of August. Uh, and whereas the AFD mentions in the media, they stay, well, they stay rich in variance. Hard to tell if anything systematic is there. You would think that uh, after uh, the sort of first third of August, those, uh, those lines are connected. We ran an analysis, uh, a, a vector order regression model, time series statistics. We couldn't find any systematic relation in, uh, in a time frame that made sense for our theory on priming, which is a few days that we're looking for. So if you talk about time series, we talk about lag and lead. And so you try to connect a data point that is further down the line with a data point that is, uh, that is not as far down the line, and nothing of statistical significance uh, uh, showed up here. Uh, and this kind of stumped us. We thought, right, when we looked at this, there was something. Uh, and we, we sort of took a step back, and we considered another possibility to, uh, as why to, as to why, uh, the media reported as they did. Did the media just give the people what the people wanted? And here is uh, why I want to talk to you about why this was a special election. This graph, I adapted this graph from the uh, Berliner Morgenpost, and they based it on, uh, uh, on surveys conducted by Infra Steam Up. Uh, onto the, uh, the data I didn't have any, any access to. But this impressively shows why there was a special election. Uh, in five out of the six preceding elections, employment was the topic that was on top of people's minds when they made the decision in terms of which party to vote for. And employment means unemployment. Uh, in 2017, with unemployment being at record lows, and uh, after 2015, having, uh, uh, or having a Syrian civil war still going on, having, uh, having, having refugees come into, into Western and uh, into Europe, uh, immigration jumps on out as the, as the topic that, that was the most important for people. Uh, and here, if we, if we look at also the, the topics that are further down the important scale uh, for vot voters, those are all topics where one could conceivably think that those can be spun in a way that they are connected to this refugee situation. 
uh, social injustice, economic injustice, that's something that a party like the AFD can very effectively turn into uh, an idea on group-based conflict. It's us versus them. Uh, same with pensions. Oh, those people come here to take our jobs and our money, and especially from the old people, from our elderly. Uh, so 2017, the Bundestagswahl 2017 uh, is a special case uh, if we consider it compared to other parties. So now having this situation where uh, we find that it's, it's something that basically never happened in recent history in, in Germany before in terms of what, what uh, made people decide at the polls, uh, we wondered, okay, well, is there a way to more accurate, uh, accurately measure this demand side of things, this, this need for information for, uh, of, of voters? And what better way there is to, to, measure some, to measure the salience in the population uh, than to look at Google queries? So we, uh, we collected Google Trends data, more specifically the... Google searches on refugees, Flüchtlinge, general term. Um, and again, here's this, this, this way to even out a trend line. This is the daily change in, uh, how, uh, in how this topic developed. And if we put our daily change of AF dimensions over that, we do see that there's something there. Uh, there's some sort of systematic rela uh, uh, relationship. And then uh, crunching these numbers and putting them again through a, a vector auto regression model, uh, we come to the conclusion that with a lag of only one day, Google searches for refugees actually lead AFD mentions in the media. So if on Tuesday, a higher number of people in Germany Googled refugees, on Wednesday, the AFD was mentioned more often than the day before. The end effect wasn't big, but it was there and it was significant. We also, of course, uh, uh, consider the alternative. Uh, and the magic word is here, it's, it's Granger causality. So you can actually calculate uh, and reliably calculate that the, the temporal su succession uh, means that one follows the other. Uh, and so all of a sudden, it becomes a bit difficult to point the fingers at the media. Uh, because if the media just reacts to an interest, it operates like a business, if we like it or not. There's the normative idea of the media, especially in a country that is rich in high-quality publications, uh, as is Germany, that the media is a public good that educates people uh, and, uh, uh, and brings out the best in them, in challenging them and, uh, and persuading them of the best side of the argument. But at the end of the day, in the online world, it is a business with a measurable outcome. You have clicks, you have trackers, you have ad durations that you can measure. And so you can see which articles uh, are favored and which articles people, uh, people last the longest on. Uh, and we're not saying, this is an important, important distinction to make here, we're not saying that there's a direct causal link between people Googling refugees and the media directly react, reacts to that prompt because there's some, uh, some search engine optimization uh, guy or girl in every, uh, uh, every, every media publishing house that me uh, monitors what people are interested in, we're saying that there's an intermediate step there. Uh, it's not a direct cause, it's just a sort of delay that is in there that allows for other mechanisms to, uh, to get in. So we're wondering, what about the consumer focusing on the demand side? And in 2017, uh, there's a few things that you could actually look at to gauge what uh, the demand side demands. Uh, and we decided to focus on Twitter. Because uh, without actually knowing this, when we first started out with collecting all this data, uh, we decided to set up, yeah, uh, to set up a, a Twitter scraper. Uh, and that way, between September 1st and September 24th, we collected 4.5 million tweets uh, that contained uh, Keywords that contain any one of a list of keywords that had uh, uh, that had political connotation. Um, so, looking at this body of data, uh, we can extract things like the top 200 most used hashtags. Uh, and if we do that, 
and we, we count the tweets that contains one of the top 200 hashtags, uh, and we pay special attention to which one of these hashtags are decidedly pro-AFD, uh, we get to a number that 30.9% of the tweets that, co that contained any of those top 200 hashtags actually contain one that is in favor of the AFD, whereas if we count the decidedly no AFD, the anti-AFD, no AFD in all ways of spelling and capitalization and so forth, that's only 1.2%. Uh, and here it becomes... Uh, of here where it becomes a, a bit ticklish. So in order to sort of give a better idea of, of, of what role Twitter might have played in our little, uh, in our little uh, relationship here between the demand side and the supply side, the supply side supplying the news, uh, we have a, a beautiful network graph. So this is a a retweeting network. This is um, we extract all the mentions of a, uh, of a of of an actor. Each dot is a Twitter user. Each line is five or more retweets. Retweets. We're aware of that. Retweets don't automatically mean endorsement. You might retweet something that is outlandish and crazy, uh, but for the sake of visualizing what the weights are on Twitter, we're treating them as the same. Uh, and anyone who ever has worked with, with network graphs of that size, they take a long time to generate, and it's kind of tough to, uh, to label them, so I'm very proud that I was able to do so. Uh, if we look at this island down there, uh, that blob, that blue blob, those are accounts that cluster around AFD accounts. The, uh, the coloring here was done by a, uh, by a walk trap algorithm, I just adjusted the colors that that algorithm used to actually match the colors uh, in, the, uh, in the German party landscape. And so we do have a, a, a hefty continent at the bottom right uh, that connects all kinds of people to, to the AFD. There, if we look at the little ap appendix below here that is uh, colored in brown, uh, that is um, mainly organized around a movement called Re Reconquista Europe, which is uh, an even further right-wing right -wing, uh, uh, movement uh, that is sort of like directly tacked um, to this island of the AFD. Uh, and the, uh, the connecting node is Björn Höcke, which is uh, uh, quite interesting. So we have the AFD down there. We have the other parties up there, the, the, the rainbow uh, that is the pluralistic political landscape. Uh, we have those, those two extreme points there at the, at the super top right and there at the bottom left. That is, uh, um, those are very extremely extreme Twitter user parties. It's the uh, ÖDP and the Freien Wähler. So they don't, uh, they don't seem to engage with, uh, with the nodes that are in the center here. Uh, but what's also valuable to note is that for the other parties, for the established parties, starting from the left and orange, the Pirate Party, and then red, the Social Democrats, purple, it's die Linke, uh, green, uh, die Grünen, uh, yellow FDP, and black, uh, the Conservative Party, CDU, CSU. All of these parties uh, have a central node, a central, a central account, around which a lot of other users are fanned out. So there's, for each party, there's a smaller number or a relatively small number of accounts that are highly favored in how often they are retweeted. AFD doesn't have that. Even, so this is, of course, a, a projection of something that's three-dimensional in a two-dimensional place, so there might be some skewing going on here in terms of how it shows on our screen, but even turning it and, and trying to identify which party is at the center, uh, wasn't, wasn't really possible. So the internal rifts and the internal uh, power struggles, they do show in how, how members of the party are, are retweeted. Uh, also interesting to note is uh, which nodes, which users are connecting these two continents, so to speak. One is that blue dot is uh, wahlrecht.de, a polling aggregator. Of course, everyone is interested in getting their polling numbers out. Uh, and there's a, that's tough to see here, but there's a, a, beige, uh, a beige user in the middle there, uh, which is Welt.de, so one of the media uh, 
uh, one of the media publications that we we actually collected data on and surveyed. Uh, another thing that is uh, that I'm just going to mention here briefly uh, is the uh, that light pink colored uh, that light pink colored insert between the greens and the central uh, gray beige dot. The, those are Jan Böhmermann, uh, die heute show and extra drei. Um, yeah, so there's a, uh, uh, the dynamics are, are clear that we have this, this party that is pretty well organized on social media uh, and, uh, and thus is able to, to dominate uh, a media agenda that is based on algorithms, basically. If you think about how, how the logic um, of, of information dissemination works on Twitter with trending hashtags, uh, if you have a party that is, that is as, as well, I don't want to say organized, but as tightly clustered around itself, within itself, as the AFD shows up here, uh, there's a good, good chance uh, that that will influence what all of us get to see when we check out the, the, Twitter, uh, the Twitter homepage. Uh, now I know that probably a good chunk of you have a burning questions in their mind, uh, and are gonna, going to want to know so how many of these, of these bright blue bo uh, blobs are bots, are Twitter bots? Uh, we tried to find that out using a tool called uh, the bot o meter which is uh, something that has an API available online where you can submit. It's a project from, uh, from a research team in Indiana uh, where you can submit the name of a Twitter user and then it gives you a, a it runs uh, lots of, lots of uh, um, analyses and, and analyzes lots of things about this user, uh, the frequency of tweets, the time at which it tweets, who is, who is it following, who is it followed by, who is it talking to, that kind of stuff. Uh, but when I tried to submit that, I, I broke their API. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, so if, if they happened to watch, I apologize, that was me. Um, so it, it wasn't able uh, to do so in time, but uh, there's a bunch of talks tomorrow that talk about uh, exactly about that uh, thing, so I'm happy to have this sort of as a lead-in for, for the day tomorrow. So what can we, uh, what can we take from this? The Bundestagswahl 2017 was a perfect storm for a far-right party like the AFD. You had a high issue salience of the topic that is at the center of its agenda, uh, and you have a sort of unregulated wild west of, uh, um, of, of social media. Uh, we'll see how that changes uh, with, with recent law changes come into effect where all of a sudden the, uh, the platform itself uh, has some liability to which kind of messages are spread, but if that's effective for Twitter, is, uh, is a whole other bag of worms. So in that sense, that's what I was, what I was sort of hinting at, uh, in, in this issue environment, we have people be interested in the topic that is central uh, for the party like the AFD is, uh, the media behaved like pretty surprisingly, uh, uh, surprisingly predictable, uh, and did not, at least for the for the topics or for the for the for the publications that we covered, um, it did so. Uh, and it, uh, yeah, and for the context that we're we're arguing here in, uh, that the AFT only get like twenty percent of the share towards the end of the campaign, is something that is a little bit surprising. And that also leads into um, into a different question of um, what does this, oh, it's the journalist's fault, actually mean? What does it really mean? Uh, this sort of is, is based on this normative expectation of the media being an impartial, uh, an impartial uh, deliverer of information. Um, and if you think about what else is going on on, on the internet, with alternative media and an alternative news sphere establishing itself uh, with news blogs like, uh, well, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to call any names because, um, and so there's there's a there's a, a sort of scene of far right fringe blogs in in Germany that we also collected, uh, and so we're uh, further down the line we're going to look at what the topics were that were covered in that. Uh, and how that connected to, um, to influencing public opinion uh, in, in Germany. But having said this, with these alternative ways of getting your news information uh, being available, if you have the press, if you have the mainstream press not covering a party like the AFD, to a certain extent, you only give the fodder 
to those cries of Lügenpresse, uh, mendac mendacious press uh, in, in, a, in, a, in members of the, of, of the population that are sort of uh, at the risk of being lost as audience members. So it's, it's kind of difficult to call, the, to call the shots here and actually point the fingers at the media because they, they delivered on informing on an interest that existed in the, po in the population before they reported on something like the AFD. Uh, and with this, I want to leave it at that. Uh, I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, and I, uh, I'm highly, highly eager to hear uh, questions and prompts and ideas how we could pursue this further. Feel free to attend the microphones. Even the microphone I don't see behind the cameras. Let's start with number two. <laughs> it should make some sound. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for your amazing work. Um, I've got only one question. Do you plan on releasing those, those collected data and on what license? Uh, <clears throat> that's a question that we, uh, that we ask ourselves too. Um, uh, we would love to collect the data, and ultimately it will happen, but we have to make sure that we actually have the right to do so with the way that we collected it, but we're definitely looking into that. Okay, number five. Yeah, you. Okay. Hello. Is this working? Yeah. Um, yeah it's tempting. I'm from the Netherlands to compare these experiences with the AFD, with the experience in the Netherlands. You know, we had Wilders, we had Verdonk, we had uh, Vertuin. Uh, now we have Baudet, and it's, it seems that there is a major difference between with the AFD because I presently, I, I, frankly, I don't know the name of the leader of the AFD. It used to be Frau Frank Petri, and now I don't know. But the, the, in the Netherlands, the leaders of the, uh, those uh, populist uh, right-wing parties, they were, they were very good in manipulating the media, they were sending out messages, sending uh, Köder in Germany, what's the word, like uh, um, they pr in provo provocating, in sending out provocations, and that attracted attention of the media. So there were people saying that you shouldn't react on all provocations. But anyway, they were geared to draw attention. And I wonder whether AFD has been to the same extent uh, active in the field of drawing attention purposely, using even um, uh, agencies that are specialized in advertising? Um, great question. Uh, there is this idea that the AFT was very skillful at, uh, at sort of insinating scandal and, and purposely doing things on a public stage that would draw attention to them. Uh, for example, this, uh, this uh, yeah, I, I say it again, this, uh, uh, this uh, expression by Alexander Gauland to dispose of a German politician, uh, or uh, the other uh, leading candidate, Alice Weidel, leaving a, a talk show uh, while it was being uh, broadcast. Um, so there is, uh, there definitely is this, is, this is element of the, of, of actually taking a scandal and using it for your own, for pushing your own agenda. Uh, whereas if they used uh, ad agencies for their media campaign, uh, they did. Their campaigning was highly professionalized um, in terms of what their, uh, uh, their posters were and how their campaign ads were worked. Uh, and they did work with a company that also was involved with Donald Trump's campaign. Um, but uh, in terms of sort of new, new media or like online media, it's not, not that new anymore, uh, in terms of what they did on online media, uh, I'm, I, I just only have an anecdotal sense if they use something like bots, uh, which is also a way of, 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 um, um, of buying, uh, buying attention. Um, I, can, I can sort of tell you about one specific case where we investigated which Twitter users were the most active in tweeting on the AFD on, on German Twitter. There's, tomorrow is a talk about a Twitter user called Ballerina, which is um, which a name that has been out there, which there's great indication that that is definitely a bot that has been 
planted and has been controlled by someone else or by uh, by uh, uh, by sort of uh, by any group of actors that is not actually a ballerina. Um, what we found was a Twitter user called Teletubby007 that tweeted in those three weeks that we surveyed 6,500 times and mostly just retweeted, um, retweeted calls to go and cast your ballot that were all put out by the central AFD accounts. Uh, and it didn't have a lot of followers, like something like 500 or so, but it just kept retweeting over and over and over and over. Um, and when we actually wanted to check out the, uh, the page of that bot, it was deleted. The user was deleted. Uh, so there's, to answer your question, um, this, this, high, this degree of personalization that the, 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 uh, uh, the, uh, the Partei for the Freiheit has in the Netherlands, is not as extreme for the AFD in Germany because there's more leading candidates and there's internal rifts, like Geert Wilders is basically his own party. Um, that's not the, the same, but the strategy to use scandal and to use something that is outrageous and push the boundary is a little bit more than jump back and say, oh no, we did not mean that at all in this way. That is the exact same spot on strategy that well, he used. I said perhaps I should add that Wilders made it oh, like... Excuse me. Many people queuing. Okay, Excuse me. Then, I'll, then I'll stop. <laughs> okay, thank you. We have questions from the internet then. Yes, um, Yugi TG is asking, uh, why do you come to the conclusion that this was a special election while the last election in Austria has exactly the same issues? Don't you see this as some sort of a global effect? Uh, that's true. Uh, a Syrian uh, civil war that pushes people uh, to flee from from, from war and save their livelihood is something that is not only felt in Germany, but for the context of Germany, it's a special election. This, this sort of situation has never, uh, has never occurred in this way before, but absolutely, uh, each election in Europe basically since 2015 um, uh, was a special election in that sense, uh, but not in terms of the outcomes in a way that because far-right parties in other European countries already had, um, had their foot in the door, and especially in Austria, where with the F, uh, FPÖ were pretty well established with previously having been part, uh, uh, part of a government and now being part of a government again. But for Germany, um, in, in what the issues were that were at the top of people's minds, that's the, the special case that I meant. Okay, microphone number three, please. Thank you. Uh, first, uh, I really appreciate the uh, sincerity and transparency of your talk. Thank you very much. We need more of this in such circumstances and maybe less polemics sometimes. Um, th there's just a little trifle in your method uh, where I was wondering how did you filter the Linke and Grüne stuff? Did you... Um, did you uh, yeah, how exactly did you do it? Did you maybe count uh, all the mentions of Grün uh, with a capital and non-capital G and uh, Linke with a capital L and non-capital and then filter it out further? Or did you do it uh, the other way around? I know that you focus specifically on the AFD stuff and uh, maybe you were focused on representing all the parties that might be relevant, but uh, I would still be interested in that part. Thanks. That's a, a great question. Um, the thing is that we used, when we, when, when we actually put all that, when, after we collect the text, before we put it through the, the analytic methods, uh, we put it all into lowercase, just so we could uh, have a consistent uh, way of analyzing. Um, and uh, with capitalization, it's kind of, sometimes it just trips up the, um, the uh, the way to treat this, and that's why we ran into these issues with, with Linke und Grüne, where we had to resort to only uh, taking basically the candidates' names, and then also Linke Partei and Grüne Partei, and a few conjugations, so uh, uh, der Linken Partei, uh, den, uh, right, like, grammatically, the cases, we only, like, we conjugated them through. Uh, but yeah, we, since our focus was on the AFD, we weren't uh, we weren't especially concerned with that, which is unfortunate, I admit that, uh, but for the purpose of this talk, we, we decided to just use this workaround. 
Okay, thanks. Okay, microphone six, please. Hello, thanks for your interesting uh, presentation. I'm wondering if you and your team, uh, so you, t you looked at mentions of the different parties, but I'm wondering if you looked at the content of the articles and how they talked about it, if they were p talked about positively or negatively. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. It's a, a great question that we actually did consider. Um, I'll answer this question with a counter question, as social scientists like to do. Uh, anyone in this room use Amazon Mechanical Turk? and works on hits to earn a few cents here and there. No? Okay, so I can speak freely. Uh, there's, a, there's a method that uses uh, cheap labor on Amazon Mechanical Turk and presents each worker with two sentences out of which they have to change the one that is more positive. Um, and so we wanted to use this to train uh, a machine learning algorithm to actually get a way to gauge the sentiment of positive and negative in the text that we had collected. Uh, we started that in early December, and we, we had a, a, like a, um, a workbook with 4,000 so-called hits, 4,000 little jobs, 4,000 comparisons. Uh, and when this job was done, uh, five or six days later, uh, we, we sort of put that, right, put that through a test and compared it with our own hand coding that we had done. Um, and it turned out that one worker on Amazon Mechanical Turk spent uh, over seven hours and worked, of those 4,000 little jobs that we had, he worked 3,980. Uh, and over 1,400 of which he did in less than two seconds. Uh, which is unfortunate because a, this person, it, so, uh, this person, right, person, question mark, probably used a script, probably used a bot, or just randomly clicked. Uh, the coding didn't match up at all with what we did hand-wise ourselves. Um, uh, and that really screwed up our, uh, our approach there. Uh, if any of you plan on, uh, on doing some hits in the new year for Amazon Mechanical Turk, and you're asked to compare uh, two sentences that mention a political actor in Germany, uh, you can send me an email and maybe a screenshot and tell me how much you appreciate that we're paying six cents for each, <laughs> for each comparison. Uh, but that's the, that's the story where we, haven't, we don't have any sentiment uh, in this analysis here. Hello, I'm from Denmark, so in this context I'm very much a ghost of Christmas future. <laughs> in your Twitter data, where you take retweets as well, do you determine what are quotes and what are direct retweets? Because in my experience, and I work with this in Denmark and in the UK, a lot of people like to distance themselves from what the AFD and similar are saying by quoting everything they're saying and giving them the press. Uh, that's a, a very good point to make. Um, we did not make any, any distinction between quotes and retweets, but we did filter uh, based on five retweets by thinking, okay, if you occasionally uh, feel like you have to point something out that is outrageous and ridiculous that a person, uh, uh, a member of a party says on Twitter, um, you would be inclined to do so less than a certain amount of time. We also tried it with, with other cutoffs. The graph basically always looked the same. Um, but if we think about what this means for, for how the demand side is influenced, it doesn't matter, basically, if, if you're retweeting out of endorsement or out of, uh, out of, out of spite. That's right. Uh, that's, the, that's the logic why we decided to, to use mentions and retweets. Thank you. Another question from the internet. Yes. Uh, Noob23 is asking, do you think that the window of commonly acceptable ideas, the so-called overton window, was shifted to the right um, by the ideas of the AFD echoed in the media? Uh, that's a good question. That's a good question. Um, something that comes to mind here is that media uses epiphenomenal. Uh, you're sort of likely, but the question is like, do you think, uh, does something happen in you because you use a certain media outlet or uh, do you use a certain media outlet because something happened in you? Um, from the sense that I got, uh, I would say that the, the degree to what is, what is acceptable 
definitely was shifted over the course of this campaign that all of a sudden we're questioning if remembering the Holocaust should be, uh, should be something that is uh, at the heart or very close to German identity. That's something that uh, uh, a political scientist would have never expected, that this cleavage can be opened up again in a, in a, in a way that is so, uh, so potent as it, as it did now. So it definitely did something to, um, to the overall discourse uh, in Germany. Uh, whereas that is an effect of, uh, of m media reporting on the AFD uh, would require us to uh, use something like this, uh, the sentiment analysis to actually determine, to determine how the media talked about which aspect of, uh, of the AFD agendas. I can see some movement behind microphone number eight. I'm sorry. I <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your work. I still do have a crystal clear question. Basically, the things you showed is something like we all know, yeah? Or we could see this happening last year, and so, I mean this year, in the last election. So I'm wondering now whether the method you used, which was basically focusing on quantity, uh, is in a sort of mirroring what was happening. And I'm wondering if you would work, keep working on it, or like you, you used buzzwords and you used the media instead of like narrowing it down or more using more specific, specific uh, questions. And I was wondering if you have this re these results now and you have proof for them, what are your next questions and how can you continue to use these uh, these, this, the, the data you have to make it more specific so we can really have some outcome and some conclusions coming from this? Uh, it's an absolutely wonderful question. Um, of course, we, we thought about using this data further down the line. Uh, we, our initial plan was to connect this uh, not just with salience data that we, that we derive from Google searches. We also have, uh, have Facebook data that we collected that we wanted to look into, but there it's a bit challenging to, um, to actually uh, analyze uh, comments in depth onto language because language uh, tends to be way more fluid and you have uh, certain problems with, uh, with selection and self-selection. Um, so you really, really have to be careful to cross-connect which person that comments on Facebook uh, is the same person. And thus, if you only do quantitative stuff, um, uh, would, would appear disproportionately. Um, as I mentioned, we have also collected data from, from far-right blogs, from news blogs uh, that, um, that very actively endorse the AFD and their topics. Uh, and so we're planning to pull this into the analysis uh, along with uh, data from the German longitudinal election study where uh, in this time frame that we surveyed in the data, each day... Uh, uh, 100 people in Germany were called up and asked uh, about their feelings towards specific parties and, uh, and actors. So we actually have day-by-day -day, uh, data once it comes out on, uh, on how people, what people thought about uh, those actors. So we're, we're planning to pull that in as a more reliable uh, measure for salience. Thank you very much. I'm very sorry, but time's up, so there will be no more questions right now in front of the audience. Alexander Bayer, thank you very much. A warm applause, please. Thank you.